Hello and welcome to this talk about the mechanistic insights into the formation of rare earth carbonates. My name is Juan Diego Reyes Blanco and I am a lecturer at Trinity College Dublin. Rare earth elements are key for industry. They are essential for many different applications, including low carbon applications, for example, to, to produce strong magnets, also for catalysis, for lasers, for batteries, for medical applications, for lenses, and many more. For example, our phones, our smartphones, contain rare earth elements, and without them, it would be impossible to operate these devices. There are three main sources of rare earth elements. We extract them from rocks, and in particular, we take them from three main minerals. They are named bastasite, which is a rare earth carbonate, monazite, and xenotime, and these two are rare earth phosphates. Also, rare earth elements have an important geopolitical component. Most of them are extracted from China, and some of them are in risk of supply. What I mean with this is that in a few decades, there could be some risk of supply of some of the heavier rare earth elements, like for example, dysprosium or terbium. Okay? Therefore, the geopolitical problem involved with this is quite important. Besides, the problem is that uh, we don't understand how these rare earth elements are concentrated in minerals, and in order to do that, it will be interesting to see active deposits. But the problem is that there is only one active deposit in the world, which is a nitrocarbonatite in Tanzania, which does not contain high concentrations of rare earths. There are three main problems that we are facing when we are dealing with rare earth elements. First is separation. Industry requires the use of individual rare earth elements, so it's very difficult to separate them because they have very similar chemical properties. And recycling is more complicated because that creates a lot of environmental harm, more than mining. Second thing is mobility. We need to understand the biogeochemical cycle that describes the movement of rare earth through the lithosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere. So we need to understand how they migrate. Okay. And also, we need to understand their origin. What are the main geological processes by which minerals that contain rare earth elements are formed and how these rare earth elements are concentrated? So I'm going to summarize these three problems in one important question, because what we need is to understand the crystallization mechanisms and pathways of rare earth carbonates, or carbonates containing rare earth elements. Of course, the same happens with phosphates, but in this talk, I will mostly focus on carbonates. Okay? So, the key questions that I'm going to address are, first, do the rare earth carbonates form by amorphous phases? For example, calcite, dolomite, these minerals form by amorphous phases. Is the same happening with the rare earth elements? Second question, if this is the case, what is the composition, hydration, and stability of these amorphous phases? What are the crystallization pathways of rare earth carbonates? And what are the parameters that control the growth of rare earth carbonates? Because one thing that we know this is that carbonates and many minerals can form by a different crystallization mechanisms. We can go from solution to crystal by following a classical pathway in which we have crystallization directly from solution or a non-classical pathway that can involve the formation of amorphous phases that later crystallize uh, into more stable polymorphs. Okay, so in order to address these questions, we have done two different types of experiments. First type of experiments are homogeneous nucleation. In that case, what we do is to mix a sodium carbonate solution with a single rare earth element solution. Okay, and also we have done heterogeneous nucleation experiments. In this case, what we do is to have an aqua solution containing one rare earth element or several, and we add calcite crystals or different carbonate crystals. Okay? When that happens, what will happen is that these crystals will interact with the solution, they will dissolve, and crystallization will tend to take place on the surface of the seeds. Okay, so sometimes what we do is to use hydrothermal reactors. So what we do is to uh, have solutions containing rare earth elements, we can mix the solutions and place them in autoclaves, in first in Teflon reactors, and these Teflon reactors can be placed inside hydrothermal cells that can withstand temperatures up to 220 degrees C. Otherwise, this Teflon of the reactor will break. So this is the maximum temperature we usually work. Here, what we can do is to mix two solutions or to interact a rare earth 
brain solution with calcium of dolomite crystals. And here what we have we can do is uh, later to obtain the solids and we we study them by using X-ray diffraction, high resolution microscopy and different techniques. And also sometimes what we have done is to use synchrotron based experiments. I mean to pass high intensity X-rays through this reactor to study the crystallization of these phases in situ and in real time to see how they transform and how they form and transform in solution. Okay. In order to do synchrotron based experiments, we use facilities like Diamond Light Source in the UK, or also Argon National Laboratories in the USA in Chicago. And what we select is a, is a beam line in which we have uh, two different techniques, which are small angle and wide angle stray scattering. Here, what we can do is to obtain data very quickly. We can see how the reaction is evolving and we can see this at very fast times. We can see uh, we can obtain data every second or every less than a second. And the information we can get from here is particle size, distribution and particle shape, and also the evolution of crystallization. We can see what phases are forming and transforming. From here, we can obtain very useful mechanistic and kinetic data. So I'm going to show you some results. For example, and I'm going to focus mostly on three rare elements, which are lanthanum, neonimium, and dysprosium. And the first thing I will show you some results from the homogeneous nucleation experiments. Okay, when we make these experiments, what we see is that at the very early stages of formation, we form an amorphous phase. This amorphous phase consists of nanoparticles, uh, which are uh, very tiny, less than 50 nanometers, usually uh, 20 nanometers and so, and Depending on time, they can take more or less time to crystallize. For example, you, you can see here one experiment in which you have time here in minutes, and here you have two theta. This two theta is an angle that if you see peaks, that means that the, this is a crystalline material. If you don't see peaks, that means that this is an amorphous phase. And the position of the peaks, the two theta position of the peaks, can tell us what solid phases we have, what minerals we have. So here what you see is an amorphous phase forming at the very early stages of reaction and then it transforms to a crystalline phase. So all the experiments that we have done show that rare earth carbonates form via an amorphous phase. Okay, so here you see how for an amorphous phase this mineral named lanthanide that forms at ambient temperature crystallizes and grows. And we have seen this with other minerals. The same happens. This is another mineral, cosoite, that forms from an amorphous phase. So you can see here the amorphous material, which are nanoparticles and the big crystals here forming via spherotic growth. Okay, what we have seen is that the lifetime of this amorphous phase is proportional to the mass of the rare earth elements. So what you see here is time, and this is logarithmic time, this is the degree of reaction, and if you have never used this notation, this is 1 is like 100%, 0 is 0%. Zero so this star indicates the onset of crystallization, and this rhomb marks the end of crystallization. And what we see is that the onset of crystallization takes place after longer reaction times depending on the mass of the rare earth element. And of course, also the crystallization is faster or slower depending on this mass. Okay, I will explain you in a moment why this is happening. So what we see also is that in order to reach Boston site, crystallization happens via different phases. First, we obtain an amorphous phase. Later, we form one phase named lanthanide that contains eight water molecules. This lanthanide is metastable and transforms into a different phase named tangerite that contains less water compared to lanthanide. Then tangerite transforms into a different phase named cosoite, which is anhydrous, and cosoite finally transforms into bastanite, which is the most stable polymorph uh, of rare earth carbonate. We have been able to, to identify these phases by using powder X-ray diffraction and also synchrotron-based X-ray diffraction. And what we have seen is that these phases don't always form. The formation depends on the rare earth element involved and temperature. And what I mean with this is that, for example, when we are playing with lanthanum, depending on temperature, this crystallization sequence can happen uh, uh, following these pathways, for example, going to lanthanide, then to cosoite, then to bastanite. At higher temperatures, you can go from amorphous to cosoite or from amorphous to, ten to bastanite. But when you use a different element, you have more or less steps 
okay, and the temperatures of crystallization can be different. And sometimes, for some rare elements, some phases don't form. For example, the most stable polymer when you are playing with this production is cosoid. The crystals have different shapes and sizes. For example, this is tangerite. Here you have cosoite, lanthanum, cosoite is prosium, uh, hydroxy bastaside, this is bastaside. But sometimes they have very nice shapes. This looks like aggregates made of many crystals. And they can have this uh, bow tie shape, so this cal cauliflower shape. And if you zoom in here, you will see that this is made of nanocrystals. They are made of tiny crystals. Okay, so I'm going to zoom first here in the center and then here in this area. And what you see here in the center is that these bow ties, they are made of crystals which are nanometric in size. And in the other side, you can see many more crystals which are growing on the surface of other crystals. In these experiments, we have seen that we form amorphous phases, and uh, these amorphous phases uh, uh, they have different stabilities. The nature of this amorphous phase is considered to be similar to, for example, calcium amorphous calcium carbonate and uh, amorphous magnesium carbonate. So this is a porous network that contains water. Okay, and this is very well known for amorphous calcium carbonate, but we know that these phases they are amorphous, they are hydrated, so we expect that they will have sort of similar structure okay so um, amorphous calcium carbonate precursors dissolve during breakdown so this dissolution that uh, transform amorphous calcium carbonate into crystalline carbonate involves dehydration processes so therefore uh, as we have water in these solids and in this case we have rare elements the dehydration of the amorphous phase must, must happen during the breakdown of this precursor phase to form crystalline rare earth carbonates. So what thing we have seen is the lifetime of this amorphous phase is proportional to the mass of the rare earth element. Or, in other words, this lifetime is proportional to the ionic potential of the rare earth elements. The ionic potential can be calculated by dividing the charge, which is usually 3 plus in these cases, by the ionic radius. This charge uh, is known, this ionic radius is also known, it is tabulated and can be found in many books. And what we have seen is that the heavier the rare earth element, or the heavier the, the, the rare earth carbonate, the longer the time that it requires to crystallize, or the higher the temperature. Okay, So why is that? That means that the heavier rare earth elements will have more strength to retain anions like water, which are... Uh, Polar molecules, and that means that because of this ionic potential, more energy will be required to dehydrate heavier earth ions because they have higher ionic potential. This ionic potential is the strength that these ions will have to retain ions of opposite charge. In the case of water, it's a polar molecule, so it doesn't matter. But this lifetime of the precursors is directly dependent on the ionic potential because more energy is needed to dehydrate heavier ions that have higher ionic potential. Okay, And this is the same behavior that has been observed with amorphous calcium and magnesium carbonates. Okay, So therefore, the lifetime of the amorphous phase will be depending on this strength of, dehydration, of this hydration cell, the ionic potential of the rare elements, and therefore of the temperature. The higher the temperature, the lower and the amount of time that will be required for dehydration. Okay. So what happens in our experiments? Okay, what we have seen is that sometimes we have these shapes, this kind of bow ties, this kind of uh, dumbbell shapes, and this kind of cauliflowers. All these phases have something in common, and these are aggregates that form at high temperature from hydrated phases, and they are a consequence of one phenomenon named spherulitic growth. Okay, crystallization of this kind of aggregates happens when uh, they form by spherulitic growth. So what happens here is that you form a single single nucleus of a crystalline material, and then there is a continuous nucleation process of new particles taking place on the surface of the existing particles and they develop they develop this shape which is at the beginning like a bow tie like a dumbbell and at the end they tend to form these spherules okay sometimes the process stops here in c or d sometimes uh, these uh, polycrystalline materials end up as spherical aggregates so 
What happens in our system is that the fast breakdown of the amorphous phase at high temperature is translated into a fast increase in supersaturation in the aqua solution. And this triggers spherotic growth. So spherotic growth is a process that requires high supersaturation levels. And the only way of reaching these high supersaturation levels is by breaking down the amorphous precursors very quickly. That will happen when these amorphous precursors have very low ionic potentials or when the experiment is running at high temperature. So what is happening in these experiments? We have multiple pathways to Bastan site, and these pathways depend on three main things. First, the composition, because for some compositions, bastansite is not stable. But second, the ionic radius of the rare elements and the temperature, because this will tell us how these reactions will be driven. The rapid breakdown of the hydrated phases will be translated into high supersaturation levels in solution, and that will trigger a catastrophic nucleation process, which is, in this case, spherotic growth. And the question would be, have we found this in nature? And in fact, there are images that suggest that there could be spherotic growth processes taking place in red carbonates. So here you can see some cosoid crystals no, from uh, different publications, uh, and they have this kind of spherotic shape. So we cannot discard that spherotic growth could be happening in fluids that contain carbonates and high concentrations of rare earth elements. Now, I'm moving to the second part of this talk, in which I'm going to focus on the heterogeneous nucleation experiments. And again, uh, here I'm showing experiments that we did with lanthanum, neodymium, and dysprosium independently. Okay, So what we do here is to place aqua solutions containing rare elements in contact with calcite crystals. So what's going to happen in this case? So calcite is going to start dissolving, and uh, calcite will react, the carbonate and calcium ions will react with the ions in these solutions. So essentially, we have a solution with rare earth elements, and then we put calcite, calcite will start releasing calcium and carbonate ions, and the carbonate will tend to combine with the rare earth elements, forming rare earth carbonates, and that will happen on surfaces. Okay, and this is what we have seen. So here you can see this picture, a crystal of calcite, and what you see here is that you have tiny crystals, which are rare earth carbonates, forming on the surface of these calcite crystals. This is at the very early stages of crystallization, and later these crystals are growing more, the surface of calcite is being covered, and at one point the surface can be fully covered, and sometimes the crystals can be fully replaced, the calcite crystals can be fully replaced by the rare earth carbonates. And this is something that we can follow by doing extra diffraction. Here you have uh, calcite, this is the calcite, uh, the extra diffraction pattern of calcite, and here we see the onset of crystallization, the first peaks of one mineral named cosoite, and then cosoite grows, the calcite main peak, black peak, decreases, and at the end we have cosoite. So we have seen how these reactions are taking place with time and temperature. And what we see, again, is that we you can follow the crystallization pathways and we see different polymorphs forming. So uh, at the beginning we have calcite and then uh, this uh, calcite reacts with the aqua solution forming lanthanide. Lanthanide tends to transform into cosoite and cosoite transforms into bastansite. And we have seen uh, how these minerals look like. This is, for example, calcite and there is a, a crust here made of uh, lanthanum lanthanide. Here, this class is forming with uh, neodymium lanthanide. Here you can see cosoite crystals forming on the surface of, uh, of uh, calcite. Some of them are oriented, and I will talk uh, about this in a minute. And here you have okay, lanthanum, neodymium, and dysprosium cosoite. And here what you can see is lanthanum and neodymium bastansite here. Now, at the end, very often, the crystals, when you see them uh, using binocular lens, they look very nice. So this is, uh, these are calcite crystals that have been fully replaced by bastansite. Okay? So the shape of calcite is preserved, but the crystal has been fully replaced by this rare earth carbonate. Okay, so we have studied these crystallization pathways during the replacement, and we see that Again, these crystallization pathways depend on the rare earth element involved and the temperature. So, for example, for this portion, we go from calcite to cosoite directly, no 
nothing else forms. In the case of lanthanum, we form all the phases, but depending on temperature, sometimes we go directly to cosoite or bastaside. In the case of neodymium, something similar happens, but the temperatures are different. So this is again depending on the ionic potential of the rare earth elements involved. And one detail is that uh, we have seen something which is very nice, which is the oriented overgrowth of one of these minerals named cosoite on the surface of calcite. You can see here calcite, uh, the host calcite crystal, and you can notice how some of these minerals are oriented in one specific direction. Then they grow up and sometimes they are covered by randomly oriented uh, crystals. Uh, because here, what is happening is that calcite is dissolving at, a, at the same time as these, calcite, as, as these crystals are growing. Okay, this is the, the end product. What we see, we have some remains of these uh, oriented crystals and then cosoite, the smaller crystals of cosoite, covering the full calcite crystal. This is happening because uh, there are structural uh, similarities between the structure of uh, cosoite and calcite. And what we have seen is that this cosoite always orients following this direction. So this is the 104 surface of calcite, which is a typical surface of calcite we can see uh, in, in hand samples. And cosoite always follows this direction, which is a 010 direction of calcite. Okay, And it's always oriented this way. So there is here, this is the orientation, the, the phases of cosoite and the orientation of cosoite uh, 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 unit cell compared to the calcite. Okay, so how can we explain this? We can explain this with Lego. Okay, so this Lego represents the structure of calcite. So here, uh, this represents like atoms in the structure of calcite. So what happens if we want to grow calcite on calcite? So we can do this. We can grow calcite on calcite by, for example, putting new pieces here like this or like that. Why is that? Because that way, uh, this new atoms or these new positions will fit with the existing positions okay now we can try with cosoid okay if we place cosoid like this this cosoid will not fit very well with the structure of calcite why is that you see here that we have one two three four positions but on calcite we have one two three four five so this fit is not very good here you see the distances between these atoms okay if we place cosoid like this what will happen is that these distances will fit better. And here we have that this distance is similar to the distance between these two positions. So we have here one, two, three, four positions, and here the same one, two, three, four positions with more or less the same distances. Okay? That will be a better fit. And this is what is happening with cosoite on calcite. It's oriented in a way that the substrate and the overgrowth are. Uh, having similar structural uh, arrangement. So this represents the structure of calcite and this represents the structure of cosoite. So here we have calcium atoms and here carbonate groups. Here we have rare earth ions and here carbonate groups and these are OHs. Okay? So I have oriented them this way so this is the way they attach to each other one on the top of the other one. And here what you can see is that the distances between these calcium atoms, the distance is 4.9 angstrom, and here the distance between the rare earth, sorry, the carbonate groups or the rare earth groups are very similar, 4.9, 5.0, okay? Here the distance between these three Calcium atoms, this is a distance of 8.0, is similar to the distance between these two rare earth elements, which is 8.5. So, although the structures are not the same, the calcite crystals provide a template. This template uh, provides some surface energy that allows cosite growing at this particular uh, orientation. So, now the final question is, have this ever been observed? What I mean is that have we ever found uh, cosoite or bastosite associated with calcite? The answer is looks like that, because here you have some rocks coming from one rare earth deposits in China, and what you see here is calcite and bastosite. And if you see this using a scanning electron microscopy, you can notice that you have bastosite here associated to calcite. So although I'm not suggesting that this is the only way of replacement reaction that could happen, it would not be surprising that uh, sometimes in some deposits, bastosite could have formed because of the interaction of rare earth elements with calcite. Okay, and that can be translated into a replacement reaction, as you can see in some of these pictures here and here. 
Okay? So this understanding of the mechanisms of formation of uh, rare earth carbon is very important to understand how these deposits could form and how these rare earth carbon could concentrate in minerals. So take home message. Okay? Basta site can form from solution directly and also by a replacement of calcite. And this can follow a very complex crystallization pathway. And this is driven mostly by the ionic radii of the rare earth element in the system, of the, the most abundant rare earth element in the system, and temperature. So with this, I finish this talk. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much to the European Association of Geochemistry for inviting me.